All right, we'll just wait for a couple of minutes, uh, just another minute, just to allow everyone to get in on time and then we'll get started. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Okay, we'll get started. Well, thank you everybody for attending another Learn It Live webinar. Really excited to go through some best indicators that we use in the market. And my name's Thomas Atkinson, and as always, I'm joined by Tyra Nabella. Hi everyone, and uh, yeah, welcome to our next edition of um, the Learn It Live series, where we're gonna talk about yeah the most influential indicators for the market conditions. So it should be a good night. Yeah, it'd be really good. So as always, uh, just to start off with, we'd like to go through a risk warning. I just need to let you know the information provided in these videos has been produced by third parties and does not reflect the opinion of Pepperstone. The information has been provided without any alteration or verification. So uh, after that, what we'll be actually covering today. So today we're going to be taking a look at how to select some of the best indicators for trading. So these are some of the ones that we've found have worked well for us. And we've also found that these are used heavily in the industry itself. So if you went to a trading desk of places like JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, those kind of places, these are some of the indicators we know they use. And we'll explain some of the reasoning behind it because it's more than just saying, let's pick an indicator and use it. It's about, does it make logical sense to our overall uh, trade and why have these been created and do they make sense on the charts. Uh, then we'll be taking a look at how these indicators are formed based on price action of the charts and we're going to be using the keep the KISS principle or keep it simple stupid principle which I always refer back to whenever trading because it's uh, very important for us to keep it as simple as possible because the simple stuff does work. And I think you've heard, a lot of people have heard this and they overcomplicate their charts. And when we coach people or we talk to people that are struggling at trading, we'll often load up their charts. And I think Tyron can attest to this. And all of a sudden they've got, you know, 10 different indicators on their charts. And you're like, whoa, what are you actually looking at? And the actual chart part of the window is, is this little slither up the top, no bigger than the indicator uh, windows. So it can be very, uh, very beneficial to keep it simple. Absolutely, and the, and the problem is too, a lot of the indicators that are actually on the charts are ones that are actually overlapping each other. So they're not even giving you any new information. So they're really, half of them are contradicting each other and the other half are basically giving the same information. So it's really, really important to keep them, I guess, in tune to what you're seeing, uh, but not forgetting the most in, important indicator of all, which is price, of course. So the price chart is the most Im important thing and the indicators are secondary. So we really have to be mindful of that when we are loading up our screen with too many indicators. Yeah, definitely a big problem we see. Uh, we'll also be talking about when to use these indicators and when not to use them. I think that's another one that we find a lot of people struggle with. They often use stochastic potentially in the wrong way. Uh, that's one I do definitely notice. So we're we'll talking about that. And as always, Q&A. So we love it when people ask questions. Feel free to ask questions at any point and just put them in the chat room. And one of our moderators at the end will answer, will give us a few of the questions and we'll answer them as best we can. So there's no stupid or wrong answers or questions. There's always, um, it's always good to ask uh, whenever you're unsure of something. So we'd love to answer those because I think it helps a lot of the people. So let's get stuck into one of our first and favorite indicators, and that is MACD, uh, Moving Average Convergence Divergence. I think I'll let Tyrone take this one because he's a specialist in this area. Uh, so Ty, you want to have a look at it? Okay, so specialist in the area, I'm not so sure, but <laughs> one, one thing I will tell you, our, our main office has nearly 25 screens with about 50 charts uh, on, on them as a co combination, and every single one of them has MACD on it. So it may not be the only indicator that we use, but it's certainly the most frequent, okay? And that's because it gives us really, really important information about the momentum of price. So the MACD indicator itself, uh, the histogram, the line that you see formed basically at the bottom of the chart, which is its own little window, 
is made, basically made up of the, the 12 and the 26 EMAs. Okay, so the histogram rises and falls as the 12 and the 26 EMA interact with each other on the chart. So we can see here on the example that we've got that the 12 and the 26 on the chart, the 26 in the blue, which is the blue line, and the 12, which is the red line. As you can see, when the two lines are moving apart, when the red one is above the blue one, which is a faster indicator, we can see that the histogram is above zero. And the further that these two indicators are apart, the bigger the histogram is. Now, as they begin um, closing in on each other and getting closer and closer together until they eventually cross, we can see that the histogram slowly and slowly gets smaller. Okay, so without even knowing what where the 12 and the 26 moving average lines are on the chart, we can tell how they're interacting just purely by looking at the moving average convergence divergence histogram on the bottom. So with, with this information, what does that tell us? So if the market's rising in a very fast fashion, as, as we can see here in the where the arrows are pointing, the price is quite aggressive and moving quickly. And as this is how moving averages work, the 12 EMA is accelerating quickly away from the 26 EMA, which is the slower EMA. And consequently, the histogram is rising, getting bigger and bigger. And as they start to get closer and closer together towards the end, you can see that they're starting to fall down. You can see that the histogram is getting smaller and smaller. So this is important because it gives us an information on what price is telling us as well as what the moving averages are telling us. We can see here where we've got the little arrow, the, the 26 arrow just above that. We can see the price made a new high and the, on the histogram, you can see that the histogram is a little bit lower. So although price is higher than the previous point, you can see that the MACD histogram is just a little bit lower and we call that divergence. And what that's telling us is that even though price has made a new high, it's probably made it on either less volume, less volatility or just less momentum than it did on the previous peak. So even though it reached a new peak, it's done it with less power. And we can see that instantly by looking at the histogram. So with MACD, it's one of those indicators that you see used on all time frames. So it's something that people will use in scalping strategies on the 15 minute, one hour um, time frames, and they'll also use it on the weekly and daily time frames. In fact, daily MACD uh, crossing from the zero above and below is something that I do know is put out in a lot of the big investment banks reports. So if you've ever read something like a UBS report or something like that, what you'll find is they often make mention to the MACD crossing above or below the zero line on the daily chart. And that's because these guys do make decisions based on this. We also get asked a lot of questions, should we change the 1226? My answer is always no. Uh, you shouldn't really change what's been working and what is used. You don't need to reinvent the wheel here. You just need to follow what you know other big players in the market or big traders in the market are doing. So leave it at 12 and 26. Uh, we definitely suggest you leave it at those rates. So here's just a quick slide uh, just to talk about how to calculate MACD. And a lot of people don't understand just even how MACD is formed. So there's just a quick bit of information there. I think Tyrone covered a lot of it. Uh, but the main thing is that it literally is those two moving averages on the chart uh, crossing when it goes from above and below the zero. And a lot of people don't even know that basic part of MACD. So here is just another chart we wanted to talk about with the crosses. Basically, we've got these crosses here and you can see what happens after in the markets. So these crosses can be pretty significant. These crosses happen on a daily chart as well. This is a great British pound US dollar. So this is one where we're seeing fairly large movements after the cross. And that's why you see a lot of people using this as their base in trading. Tyron, do you, do you want to mention anything else about daily MACD? Well, the daily, um, when you say daily MACD, I mean, the MACD uh, basically repeats itself exactly on whatever chart you're putting it on. So in that regard, yeah, the daily MACD is probably one of the more important ones because that's where the majority of people are, are looking, especially the, um, the big internet, uh, institutional traders. But more importantly, it's the, the fact that it's actually giving you daily candle information as opposed to just one hour or 15 minute information means that there's multiple markets looking at it. So you've got three or four different markets around the world all uh, basically looking at the, the changes in the MACD. Yeah, another thing that's quite large about these daily 
uh, MACD or anything like that is that you've got to think about who are the biggest traders in the world and who are the, really the traders that are making the markets and making these movements happen. And they are you know, professional traders that work maybe eight to 10 hours a day. And I say this to a lot of people, think about if you're on a 15 minute chart versus a daily chart, how many people are seeing your 15 minute candle closes and therefore your 15 minute MACD? How many people are seeing your daily four hour ones? A lot more because they've got the time to come in and say, okay, I see that four hour close or that daily close, therefore I can trade that particular um, pattern or indicator or anything else we're using. So we really like those time frames for these particular indicators, but MACD is great across the board. We highly suggest you start or think about using this in your trading techniques. And we'll talk about how to use MACD with Bollinger Bands, which is another one, a little bit later. Couple of quick rules to follow. As you can see, just the crosses here and what we're talking about when these crosses happen. Now this is one, uh, again, Tyrone, do you want to talk about this particular trading system? Yeah, okay, so a lot of people can see the red, the red line that goes through the histogram. That is actually a nine moving average of the other two moving averages. So as much as it's, it's look, it's complex to work out really, I mean, and there's no need to understand why. All you need to do is know that it is actually a smooth moving average of the histogram. So the trading method here, which is a very standard one, is basically just trading short when the line, the signal line exits the histogram. We can see here that it's done that at B. And entering long when the, when the signal line actually enters the histogram, we can see there at C and basically doing it until it does cross below the zero and doing the opposite on the other side. So we can see here at F when the signal line has come out of the histogram and started to rise, we can take a long position and we can go long again at the G where the nine moving average again has moved into the histogram. So basically all that's doing is showing us that the momentum is shifting on the chart. And we, we know that because the signal line, because it's an, a moving average of the histogram, we know that it's actually interacting with the histogram as it falls and rises in momentum. So this is a very, very simple strategy, but at the same time, it shouldn't be understated because it does work quite well. And you can see all of the entry points that are placed here with the A, B, C, D, E, F, G, all of them have given pretty good returns for what is a very, very simple strategy. Yeah, and when you couple this up with a few other things and in terms of trends and other things that you're looking for, you can actually create quite a powerful strategy. So that's why we do suggest think about these things, think about these strategies and implementing them into your already existing plans. So we'll just quickly load into the chart. And I just want to put on MACD here on the chart. We've also got Bollinger and a couple of moving averages here. But you can, you can see again the histogram, what it's doing. Recently on the US dollar yen, we had a big movement to the upsides, we saw a big movement to the, the long or the bullish movement. Now this was caused by a few things, but we actually had a really nice pattern appearing here. And today's not really focused on patterns, but I, I thought I'd just put that in. Let me just quickly change these lines so you can see. But uh, we had this nice pattern break, and at the same time as the pattern break, you have to excuse the why, this is basically what they call an ascending triangle and it breaks here and at the same time it breaks just before that we see that MACD cross to the upside. So that's something where it's that extra confirmation that you're looking for and that explosion that happens afterwards can be used alongside maybe one of your pattern recognition techniques. So MACD, pretty powerful stuff when used with your other systems. Have you noticed even on this chart, this is a four hour chart of the USD yen. Oops, we just go back to that one. Okay, so even with this chart, we can see how powerful both strategies are in regard to the divergence that we were talking about earlier, but also the signal line just entering the histogram. We can see at the first peak where it, where it touched the uh, resistance line, which you know, could now be support, you can see that the, the signal line right there exited the histogram which actually triggered the big fall that we saw that went all the way down to the bottom of the ascending triangle, as you can see where the arrow is going to now. And then again, when the signal line came out of the bottom of the histogram, we can see that started the rise. So basically the top of that ascending triangle and the bottom of the ascending triangle all began from that signal line entering the, the histogram and exiting the histogram, just like we spoke about following the simple rule. 
And even as far as the very, very last um, exit of the histogram at the end of the chart here, we can see that that started the significant move down, which although hasn't completely broken all the way down, uh, we don't really know where this one's going to go, but it has already given us a pretty good move. Like remember, this is the four hour chart. So with this kind of chart, what you'd be looking for is potentially a pullback to, as Tyron said, our resistance becomes support, and then maybe we can implement some MACD ideas around that uh, if we were looking for more longs. It's just an example of where I saw an explosive move this week, and a lot of other traders will see it, and it was coupled with that big movement of the MACD to the uh, obviously positive side and it rising uh, through. So I thought that was quite interesting to have a look at. All right, so next up is our stochastic oscillator. So this is one that probably every trader has used at some point in their lives. I think everyone's used stochastic out there. It's part of most good scalping systems, but I do find a lot of people use it at the wrong periods of time. So they often use it maybe not in sideways markets, but they use it heavily in trending markets and they can't recognize that. So what a stochastic oscillator is, is a lot of people see it as you've got an overbought zone and you've got an oversold zone. And you can see every time that these two oscillators, the fast and the slow oscillators go above the overbought zone, what people do is they look to sell the market and they sell at that point until it turns again to the upside or it goes into the oversold zone. The same can be said for the opposite side here if it goes to the oversold zone. It goes down, crosses, when that crosses and it goes back up, what you're seeing is a potential buy zone and people buy that. Now it's important to note, this is something where if you're looking at a range bound market, it's really good because what you're doing is you're trying to sell the highs and buy the lows and you're expecting potentially the market to stay within a zone. And that's why it becomes quite a powerful tool when you recognize patterns like channels. Stochastic oscillators are amazing with channel based trades. But if you start to use overbought zones and then say, okay, we're going to sell into overbought zones and the market's trending higher and higher and higher, the problem with that then becomes is you're countering what the market is doing. So the market's on a massive trend and you're trying to say, wait, stop here. I want you to come back down and go back into the oversold zone. And we can all probably attest to being caught out in that kind of situation. I know that's definitely something that happened early in my trading career where we made mistakes, where we were basically buying um, in the oversold zone while the market was trending down. So that's definitely something that we've, we've found. A couple of quick stochastic rules to follow. So these are the ones we just spoke about. Go long when the stochastic moves down past the oversold level, then rises back above. And rule two, go short when the stochastic moves up past the overbought level and then drops back below. So it's something that is, uh, you know, pretty good basic stochastic rules. Tyrone? Look, stochastics is one of those indicators as well where you don't really want to be just relying on its signal only. It is very good. And if you are trading it in a channel like Thomas alluded to, it's probably one of the best channel trading indicators there is. But if you are going to use it in the direction of a trend, which you can do by moving the levels, it's definitely better to have you know, some extra confirmation, either from price making new highs and new lows in an uptrend, or actually having the uh, lower highs and lower lows in a downtrend. But having something like MACD confirming it, or even Bollinger Bands, which we're gonna talk about a little bit later on, uh, just confirming what the stochastics are saying. So they can be used in isolation, definitely in a channel, if you want to use that with some price action to confirm. But in a trending market, yeah, they're not the, the best trending indicator, even though they can be used. So you just want to be mindful that you are using it in the right market. I just thought I'd quickly load up uh, one of these charts, because obviously we always want to put it back to learn it live. Uh, and there is, the oscillators will always be moving and this is a four hour chart on the Euro US dollar. But what we can see is that we previous had just a really basic support over here uh, at the zone of 1.153. And then it came back down and almost hit that zone a little bit later, maybe a day or so, a few, quite a few days later, and it hit again at this level. And what we saw was this massive oversold stochastic and then it crossed back up. So these kind of levels, when they couple together, what you can do is you can potentially put in your buys here and the same kind of thing can be said again over here. You've got that massive oversold market and you've got this nice support. The market's clearly found support here 
and that could be a zone where we're interested in potentially placing trades. So this is becoming, I guess, a range-bound market, especially at this stage, because the market's already said multiple times it's tried to break to a new low on the four-hour chart and been unable to do so, and that's where we can come in using stochastic and say, okay, what has the market told us before? It's told us that it's struggling to get past this zone. We've got an oversold market in terms of the stochastic. When it crosses back through, we can potentially look at the buy side. So it's important to see this previous proofing before we start making these decisions because if we bought every single time this oversold happened here on the stochastic, we probably wouldn't have done that well. But when it does form a base and it comes down and potentially not this time, but over here, when you're seeing it for the third time, that can be a very powerful indicator reason for us. So when you're seeing the stochastic for the third time on a zone, often that means that a lot of people are seeing it. And it goes back to that logical steps. Are people at UBS, Goldman Sachs, these guys that are placing large traders, investment bankers, those kinds of things, are they seeing it and are they prepared to potentially place larger trades on this trade? Does it make logical sense for them to do that? When they're seeing evidence where they're seeing multiple touches to the zone and then they're seeing again it coming down, they've got this oversold stochastic, that's the kind of evidence that they're looking for and then they say, okay, we're prepared to put the millions behind it and that's what you want to see and that's potentially what we've seen here. So it's just always think of it logically. Does it make sense for these guys to be doing that? So a lot of people are probably thinking, well, we've all heard of stochastics and we've all heard of MACD. You know, are these really what, you know, the indicators that, you know, these professional traders are using? Look, one thing we can promise you, um, we trade a lot and the only indicators that we use are the ones we're going to talk about. Well, this is uh, basically our first one, three of our main ones today. And aside from RSI and standard moving averages, we do not use any other indicators. That we promise you. And a lot of the biggest traders in the institutional world do the same thing because there is no secret um, indicator that's going to give you the signals that are going to work out every time. But these indicators, although they're popular, they're popular for a reason and they're very, very powerful. So the key is to actually use them again in the right market. So we can see here that yeah, every time it did get oversold at this um, support base that we've got on the Euro USD four hour, it reacted quite strongly. So if you were trading primarily on that signal, you can see straight away that you've got three very, very good moves out of the, um, the drops that we've seen. So when you, and, and you can probably work out that when you do get a nice channel, you're getting the equal amount of trades um, on the downside as soon as it hits the top of it. And it is a very, very reliable signal. And it's just also important to remember that the bigger the time frame that these indicators are appearing on and set, giving you these signals on, the more strength there is in it. Okay, so the moves are going to be bigger and more people, again, more people are seeing it. So it's, it's important to remember that. And I just wanted to kind of reiterate that because look at this zone. I mean, this zone has been so strong for so many years. This is 2015. And a lot of people go, oh, man, that's crazy. But, but the thing is, this is what bigger traders are seeing. They're seeing these previous resistances. They're seeing these supports. And then they're using their indicators and other methods to get further information about potentially placing those trades. And that that's just the power of, of using a couple of simple systems to place your trades and to make sure it makes logical sense. So very, very cool here. And that's definitely a way you can add in stochastic. And I think actually what, let's add in MACD and see whether that would have been helpful to us as well. And I think Tyron's gonna say instantly yes. <laughs> what do you think about this one, Ty? I think it's just glorious. <laughs> because yeah. we can why, see, why is that, Ty? <laughs> well, we can see very clearly that um, the three touches on that uh, support line that was, you know, potentially previous resistance quite a, a number of months and years ago is showing a, a very strong divergence signal on the MACD. So we can see here on the black line, here we go, we can see very clearly that the histogram is rising and as and look at even without using those moving average lines on the screen we can see very clearly that the 12 moving average which is the red line is starting to turn up and it's getting closer and closer to that blue line which is the 26. Oh, these, one, these ones actually are a little bit I, I didn't i cheated a little bit there i didn't make them the right ones <laughs> oh, there, well, let's make a there we go. Yeah. there you go okay but 
I guess we'll, we'll, have, we'll let, that actually proves my point um, that mm. even without those lines there, I knew what was happening just simply by what was happening on the histogram. So this actually even looks far more attractive because we're about, as you can see, to cross into the into the zero zone and up into positive territory. So if it hasn't already briefly, the red moving average, the fast one, is about to cross above the slow one for the for the first Very time close. in quite some time on the zero USD. Yeah, and with this coupled with this divergence, coupled with our four-hour analysis, all these types of things, and then you bring in something as simple as all of a sudden you get a bullish movement on the euro and it breaks and closes above here, then you're looking at potentially significant bullish movement. So whether we think it's going you know all the way up now or not, we don't necessarily know. But what we know is that these were good zones, and as a trader, it's about us honing in and finding good zones knowing where our stops need to be, which in this place time, if we were placing orders here, our stops would need to be below the lows, which would be somewhere around this point, and knowing that if we see these confirmation signals, that's where we can potentially add into our orders, and we're seeing all of these indicators agreeing with that. And as Tyron said, this movement from the negative MACD to the positive, especially on the daily, is going to be very significant. So if that couples with the same time that this breaks to a new high and closes, all of a sudden you've got bigger traders coming in with you to place that trade. So today is about indicators, but it's also about thinking, well, does this indicator, what it's telling us, is it helping us to potentially place trades that we can hold for a longer period of time? Does it make sense? And can we put all the evidence together? Because trading is evidence. How much evidence can we get to place this trade? And with that, the importance of you know, what the indicators are actually called, indicators, is giving us an indication of what price may or may not do. And that's what's it's important, not to be driven by what the indicator is saying, but to be guided by what they could be potentially uh, giving us as information to what price is going to do. Because no matter how powerful an indicator is, the most powerful one of them all is still always price action and it always supersedes any signals coming from an indicator. Absolutely. So another one is Bollinger Bands. This is one that we do use heavily and we do find has been well, it's quite efficient, I guess, in scalping systems and things like that, uh, where you're looking for potentially retracements or you're looking for extra confirmation each way. Uh, so Bollinger Bands, what they're really based on is, I guess, a standard deviation away from which moving average, and that's a 21, isn't it, Ty? How does this work? It doesn't interact the way. Get the confidence in the system and then potentially build that around some other things. Even if you add stochastic to this and you're looking at potentially an overbought zone here, you're seeing all of this other stuff. Well, guess what? It's more evidence for us to be able to place our trades. And the great thing about this, it's really simple for where we're going to place our stop because we're already, we basically just need to place it above the last wick of the candles. It's not, not going to be rocket science where our stops need to be. So it's quite simple. We're usually going to get really high risk reward kind of trades. And a lot of people, as you well, we all we all went high risk, like high reward trades for low risk, and there won't be too much risk in this case. So let's just quickly jump back into the charts and add our standard Bollinger. So with Bollinger's, just go trend, Bollinger bands, 220, as you can see here. I do have sometimes 21. The reason that 20 and 21 are so popular is because if we think about the amount of trading days in a month, well, how many are there? There's four, you know, four weeks basically in a month, trading days, basically five trading days, so that's 20. So often you'll find 20, 21, those kind of things. Very, very popular moving average for a reason because it really represents the trading month. And in human psychology, we like to break things down into months and quarters and yearlies. So that's why you'll often find a lot of these moving averages and even a lot of these indicators are based on that kind of, I guess, you know, basic methodology. Does it make sense again? So here we have our daily. Let's just jump down to the four hour quickly and see what was happening. So you can see a few breaches here of the Bollinger Bands, the breaches that were happening at our support. Uh, when those breaches happened, we're getting breaches at the same time as we're getting over oversold stochastic at the same time as we're getting that really nice divergence on the daily. So all of those things coming together, we're basically confirming what we need to know to place these trades. And that's the exciting thing about trading. We're putting together, 
I guess there's many reasons as possible, and we're getting into trades. Anything else to mention, Ty, do you think about this one? Yeah, one, one thing I do want to mention about the Bollinger Bands, and, and when you see it in the real market, if we are here on the four hour Euro USD, you can see how it contains what, what they would estimate probably 98% of price. So we very, very rarely uh, change away from the two standard deviations on normal market conditions. And the only reason we would ever change the standard deviation lines is that if the price was actually outside of the bands more than we would be comfortable with. So if you had a very, very volatile uh, pair, for instance, like uh, the Mexican peso, for instance, if um, when Trump was being elected, <laughs> when Trump was being elected, um, you'll find that the price actually sits outside of the Bollinger Bands or a standard two de deviation Bollinger Band far too much for it to be actually useful. So in those instances, you can actually increase the standard deviation amount to to two and a half or even three in some cases on the very very volatile uh, pairs or stocks, and and then what you're going to get is that 95 to 98% of price being captured inside the bands most of the time. Because if they're not in the bands um, for the majority of the periods that you're looking at, they're not really going to be as useful because what you're looking for is for those explosive moves out where the luck of band effect can take place. So the only time we would ever recommend uh, adjusting Bollinger Bands is for the reason that the stock is very, or the currency pair is very, very volatile. And, and then you can increase it by half just to see how much more price is captured in it. And if needed, maybe take it out to three. Yep. Yeah, and, on, the, and on, the, on the flip side, um, if you've got a pair that is very, very slow, um, and look, it doesn't really happen these days. There's not that many pairs that we could even come up with that don't have um, that much movement. But if the market for some reason into the future started to slow down a lot and yeah, a lot of the volatility left it and you still wanted to use the Bollinger Bands, it's at that point you can actually bring the, the timers in and say, we'll only put the bands at one and a half times deviation instead of the two. And what that does, will it'll actually bring them right in. Actually, just for the sake of the exercise, can we actually just do that one on this one? We'll change this Bollinger Band just to give you a bit of an idea of what we're actually talking about. Yeah, so, so we'll, we'll go take, to bands. So first we'll, we'll change it to three for starters. So we'll take it to three standard deviations. There we go. Okay, so you'll, so you'll notice now that the breaches um, are very, very minor when they do go through of the Bollinger Bands and nearly probably 99% of all candle action is actually inside the bands now. So they're not really proving all that useful because for the most part, price is actually struggling to reach the ends of the bands. Whereas before, you know, you were having pretty nice moves off them. So what we'll do now, we'll actually take it in to a one and a half times deviation. So we'll just go back into the settings, make it one and a half. And now you can see that, you know, price is spending quite a bit of breach. <laughs> yeah, it's very serious breaches. And price is spending quite a bit of time outside it. Like they're going past quite a lot on several occasions. So although it's still giving you signals to get in and out of the market, they're not as convincing as they were when we were looking at the two standard deviations, which is far clearer. So I thought this would, this would be a good one to bring up just quickly, the pound yen, because obviously this is called nicknamed the beast for a reason, because when the moves happen, they can be very large. And you can see this one and a half standard deviations really is just not effective here. Yeah, there's, there's as many candles outside the Bollinger Bands as there is, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I think you lose, guys, guys, if you're using this. <laughs> Right. And look, this is why, guys, it's really, really important to understand what the indicators are actually telling you and what they mean. Okay, so a lot of people trade indicators without really understanding what they're seeing. They're just uh, understanding what they're being told. So if you are going to use an indicator, and if you choose to use indicators that we're not talking about, that's fine as well. Of course it is. As long as it makes sense to you what the indicator is trying to tell you, because it's very, very important that you understand what the, in, what the implications of a, an up or a down move are on that indicator. Because only then can you really use it with the power and conviction that you need to, to be successful. Yeah, it really is like that. Okay, so I think we've covered three of the major ones today that of course we use. Uh, there are other ones out there, some other ones that you can always consider, of course, momentum indicator, RSI. We do find, I guess, a warning on RSI. RSI and stochastic, they almost show the exact same uh, I guess, you know, 
reasons to be in a trade. So what we find they're very, very, we, they're very similar. Yeah, yeah they're, when, they're, we, when uh, we coach people, they've often got both on there and they're like, oh, in my points based system, the RSI and the stochastic both said go. The problem is they're both always going to say go. So there's no reason to have a double up. And that's why we usually leave RSI off and, and prefer stochastic, I guess, in, in our trading. Then we've the also got um, yeah, volume, you go, Ty. Sorry, yeah, the volume indicator can be a very powerful indicator, but it's far more powerful on the bigger currency pairs that do get traded a lot. The bigger the volume, the more important the volume indicator is. If you've got a very lightly uh, traded currency pair or commodity, uh, and there are there are some out there that are very, very um, exotic that don't get a lot of traction, the volume indicator isn't going to be anywhere near as powerful. Okay, so it's important to note that a volume indicator on the Euro USD versus uh, a commodity that you know is traded you know one one hundredth of the volume of the euro usd is not going to give you the same signal power as yeah the high uh, volume indicators in the stock in the stock world volume is far more important because it's yeah. a totally different thing but in in the currency markets in the c um so in some of the cfd markets volume is a little bit less used yeah, it definitely is. And then, of course, you've got things like parabolic. So we might do a webinar on that if that's a popular one to have a look at. It's definitely something interesting to learn. Uh, we quite like parabolic SAR, but again, tonight we covered some of the majors that we think you can use in scalping strategies, you can use them in long-term strategies, you can pretty much use them in anything. So I'll just hand it off to one of the Pepperstone guys and see, and put in your questions, by the way, if you have questions. Uh, we'd like to answer some now. Hi guys, so thank you very much for your time, been great. Uh, I do have a couple questions. I wanted to start with the first one, which I think is the most important one, since you guys spoke a lot about sideways market and trending markets. Yeah. So the question is how to better recognize uh, if a market is, is going sideways or it's, if it's trending down or up. All right, I'll give everyone a really quick, easy tip, I guess, that's going to probably, it's a bit of a cheat, it's not the 100% way of doing things, but I think it's gonna make it very easy for everybody. So when we're recognizing markets, what I like to do is if you put something like a 200 moving average on, very heavily used in the markets everywhere, and you literally just go straight to a daily or a four hour chart, pretty much if the price is above the daily 200 moving average, what we're looking at is usually a buyer's market or a bullish market, if price is below the 200 moving average, it's usually a seller's market and, and you're looking more for the sell side of things. If That's just a really simple way of doing it. And what you can do is if you follow something like this, you'll see that the price really doesn't cross these 200s very often. But when it does cross, that can be an incredibly aggressive long-term move. So if you're looking only for buyers here on the euro, you would have done obviously very well in terms of the rules of numbers. And to the sales, even here, we're looking now more to the sell side. You would have done a lot more success recently than, than the buy side. The thing with trends is you always need to realize when has this trend stopped. So the best pattern for you to learn or for everyone out there to learn is going to be channel patterns and how to correctly identify those. We have done a Learn It Live on them, so please go back and look at it. We really give you rules to follow when looking for channels. But channel patterns and when you're seeing multiple supports and resistances being hit, like here, where we're starting to see multiple supports, all of a sudden, this is kind of causing us to say, okay, maybe the end of this sell-off has happened and now we need to think that the market doesn't have a direction. So I think you heard me before saying, unless the market breaks above here, it will then get a direction towards the upside, which would coincide with potentially a move above the 200 again. And if it stays in this zone, it's really a sideways market and we can bring in our indicators at least on the daily. Same goes for the four hour. If we ever see the market basically sitting there in a zone, and we have seen that a lot of the time where you're seeing similar resistances being hit and similar supports being hit, this is really a sideways market at this point and you can start to use those indicators like stochastic and stuff to place your trades. Last one, just I, I want to bring it in just quickly before Tyron says anything. Always look at your larger time frames and just think, well, has a significant area of support resistance get gotten hit yet? And and here on this euro, what you'll notice is that this euro weekly had some massive support here, 
and then all of a sudden it hit that support and became resistance and there's no there's a very strong reason for why this started to sideways market or become range bound at this zone so whenever you see these massive longer term time frames getting hit to the support of the resistance side we can definitely uh, think that that's now a sideways market yeah and all i was going to add when you when you do go back and see the the learn it live that we did on the channels just to keep it um very simple if you get two touches of support and two touches of resistance in the same area that gives you enough information to draw the channel and you can call that a sideways market yeah so two touches each way when we talk about that in the rules so two really Two easy ways to fall. Yep, uh, underneath the 200 for a downtrend, up above the 200 for an uptrend, and two touches of support and resistance for a sideways market. Yeah, really simple. Perfect, then we have another question. Uh, that's quite a good one. Uh, it says, can we use Bollinger Bolling Bands with Stochastic and MACD at the same time? Reason being Stochastics move fast and turns before the MACD turns. Uh, okay, what so was that yeah. you go, what was that last little bit of that question? Sorry, the, what was that last bit of that question? Because yeah, the, the last bit was like the uh, reason being oh, that God, the stochastics moves faster than the MACD, oh, and so it turns faster than you know the MACD it moves a little faster. Yeah, okay. Well, yes, the stochastics is faster. Um, the Bollinger Band of the of the three indicators is definitely the quickest because that's the one driven by price volatility. So, and, and what I mean by that is. But the stochastics, um, even for a stochastic signal to move in a particular direction, it's still using the last 14 periods to determine where it's going to move next. So it has to drop off 14 periods ago. So even if we get one big explosive candle, say a news candle, that would be enough to start moving the stochastic in a particular direction, but it wouldn't move it significantly like, say, a price candle blowing out a Bollinger Band. So um, in terms of speed, Bollinger Band is definitely the fastest followed by the stochastics and followed by the MACD. Uh, to say that you could use the three together, look, there are going to be situations where you potentially could, but I wouldn't be convinced that they're going to give you any more information than, than two of them working together. And that is because, yeah, you're, you're right, the, the MACD, the, Mac, the speed of the Bollinger Band and the, the steadiness of the MACD do make a quite a good mix. But what I find is that the stochastics does work with those two indicators, but the stochastics of a time frame lower, if that makes sense. So if we were actually doing an analysis on a daily chart and we saw a situation where the MACD and the Bollinger Bands agreed on, say, a divergence pattern, what I would do is actually go back to a, a four hour time frame and look for a stochastics entry on the four hour time frame. And that way the indicators actually complement each other better because the time frames seem to even up a little bit more. The speed and the steadiness of the MACD and the Bollinger Bands on the bigger time frame are complemented by the entry of the stochastic, which can usually be pretty sharp on a smaller time frame from a, a signal diver, um, of divergence on a bigger time frame. If that makes sense. Does that make sense? Yeah, so what we're talking about is using multi-time frame analysis. Effectively, we'll use, let's say, find something like the MACD here on the daily, and then we'll say, okay, this looks really interesting to us. Then we'll jump down into one of the smaller time frames, and then we'll start to bring in maybe our stochastic and our support resistance in this case, and say, this is our oversold level. We're also seeing a breach of the Bollinger at the same time. We were happy with the MACD on a larger time frame. Let's get involved. Hopefully that answers that question. Yes, uh, so we have the last two questions. Okay, should support and resistance be included always in your all your trading decisions? We, we, that's a good question. We do think so because support and resistance really is human psychology. When you think about it, if, if a price is reached and I guess parity is the easiest one to use, parity means, by the way, when a currency, uh, currency values are equal to each other, so they're both worth one. Uh, but that's a huge psychological number, and it's just like every 10 cents. If we saw, saw the Australian dollar, for an example, when the Australian dollar was at $1.10, it was really struggling to get to $1.10. It was hitting $1.10 and almost hitting $1.10 and then just selling off straight away. The reason that happens is because that was a psychological number and it was also, turns out to be a resistance point because of that psychology behind it. 
So we really like round numbers as humans and it's something where I think when we're talking about support resistance, it, it, it really does mimic exactly what a lot of humans' psychology is. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think that the thing is with trading is you you always want to take the path of least resistance. And, and by that I mean, yeah, you want to take the easiest path to take profit. So trading into a heavy resistance zone or trading down uh, from above a support zone to try and break it is not really making the journey as easy as it can be. Now, of course, these, these zones do get broken, but it doesn't mean that you want to be the leader of the army yeah, making the first attack. Let them get broken first. So we always find respect them when they're there and incorporate them whenever you can. And if they're not there, well, then it's probably a directionless market that is you know, heading towards one of those zones anyway. So trade into it. Uh, I was just thinking of that Sparta film. <laughs> you don't want to be those guys. They got slaughtered. That was really bad for them. So, yeah, absolutely. Support resistance. We really believe it's it's incredibly important. And we do suggest to all our students and everyone that's out there trading, um, form it as, as part of your base. Yeah, absolutely. Good question. <laughs> Perfect. Last question, guys. Um, I, this guy wanted to know if all everything that you guys showed here could also work in intraday setup. Yes, it can. So, yeah, you can use all of these things on the smaller time frames. It's actually where we really use a lot of these indicators. We use them heavily on the one hour, four hour uh, time frames down to 15 minutes. So what Ty was talking about before is we really like, maybe you look at daily and you find out some trend or something like that, but then you jump into the four hour, one hour, and you can really intraday trade that. So these will work there. And we do know they're heavily used and we've had success with them. So, yeah, I would say not a problem. Everything that we've talked about tonight, every indicator and every setup that we've talked about tonight can be transferred to any time frame, really. So depending on if you're, a, if you're trading intraday, you're going to be looking at five minute and 15 minute candle charts or maybe even one minute predominantly. Um, everything works exactly the same way it all gets adjusted the only thing that changes is um the expectation of the move so the rules are all exactly the same so there's certainly no yeah. issue just modify the time frame but don't so modify exam, them. yeah exactly don't modify what you what you're expecting so just like an example of that if we were you know buying or let's say down here for whatever reason we would never really be expecting for if our ruling was just based on Bollinger Band alone, we would only be expecting it to go back to potentially the other side. Uh, we, we don't want to get unrealistic expectations. So always modify your stop losses and take profits to the relevant time frame that you're trading. That's a good question as well. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for coming out today. We really appreciate it as always, and we love the questions. So thanks very much for asking them. And next time we're here we've got another really good topic so looking forward to covering that with everybody and as always bring your questions and even if you've got stuff and you're writing it down and it's not 100 percent relevant to the night's topic sometimes we'll answer one of those as well so thanks very much and we'll see you next time thanks everyone and um yeah good to have you on board excellent thanks guys